Okay, thank you. I think we can start this um, second plenary session of the conference. Um, I will just say a few words to introduce our guest speakers. Um, I am Paolo Magauda, I'm a secretary of STS Italia. And as secretary, I will also start with a small uh, advertising of uh, Tecnoscienza. I remember you that uh, STS Italia uh, publish uh, this open access journal that can be downloaded uh, open um, in the website uh, of the journal. Uh, you can find some copies um, outside and the journal welcome articles that uh, focus on science technology but also about design and other topics that are connected with many of the um, topics that we are dealing with in this conference. So I'm very happy to uh, chair this session uh, because uh, this is a special session in some way, a, spe a special plenary session. And it's a, sp probably we can say that it's a doubly uh, special session uh, in this conference. The first reason because it's special is, uh, the reason is that um, this session is about design is, and is about the intersection between STS, science technology studies, and design. Uh, this is one of the um, main idea behind this conference. The idea was to put together people that are more focused on the study of science, technology, artifacts, materiality, and other people coming more directly from the field of design. So one of the aim was to put together this different perspe perspective. And this session, this plenary session, is built with this idea. The second reason, because it, this is a doubly special session, is, uh, as you can see, we have two uh, speakers and not just one, like yesterday or like tomorrow. Um, we have two speakers and that we hope that can um, bring two different perspectives that in some way um, can be complementary one each other to, um, uh, to build a connection between design and science technology studies. Um, so I will present very quickly our speakers. Uh, we have Elisabeth Chauve from Lancaster University and uh, Ketil Fallan from University of Oslo. Um, Elizabeth Chauve is a uh, uh, well-known uh, scholar in STS. Uh, he's uh, uh, well-known uh, especially for his work on uh, uh, theoretical work on the practice, on the social practice. I will say uh, something later when um, uh, Elizabeth will uh, start to speak. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Ketil Fallan. Ketil Fallan is an historian of design, but he's in some way a um, Mm, uh, particular historian because he is, is a, an historian with a sensibility um, uh, toward uh, science technology studies but also uh, with a more cultural dimension of the history of design. Um, I want, he is author of several books about design, history of design, theory of design. I want just to mention one book given that we are in Italy, in Milan, um, his book, uh, this book is a book of, um, uh, is, is, uh, um, has been published in last year, so it's very, very, very new. Uh, it's titled Made in Italy, Rethinking a Century of Italian Design, which is an edited book with several chapters dealing with uh, uh, the aesthetic, the history, and the cultural influences of Italian design. Um, Ketil will uh, speak about uh, um, sustainable design, uh, a critical reflection uh, about sustainable design, which is a very important uh, topic, as you know, as you imagine, uh, in design. And uh, uh, please, Ketil, we are curious to listen to your talk. Thank you for that introduction, and um, first of all, thank you to the um, organizers for for inviting me. I mean, it's uh, 
For me personally, it's a great privilege to be to be back here um, in Milan. Um, firstly, because this conference opens up this conversation between STS and design studies, which has been absolutely formative for me as a scholar, but it's always felt like a fairly um, solitary conversation. So uh, being able to share it with uh, this amount of, of people is great. Um, secondly, because um, these very days, it is exactly 15 years since I had to leave this magnificent city, having spent a year here as a postgraduate student doing archival research for my first sort of venture into design history, which was on 1950s Italian design discourse. And as, uh, as um, uh, was mentioned here, my latest uh, book is on Italian design history, so it feels like coming full circle in a way. Okay, um, but today I'm going to talk about something uh, quite different. Um, let's see if I can... Okay, here goes. Uh, this is um, very tentative stuff. It's uh, an effort to sort of outline some, some background uh, or, or framework for sort of a, a, a new um, venture, a new um, project in a way. Um, trying to uh, historicize the development towards uh, the, the rise of sustainability as a major trope in, in design practice, in design education, and in design research. I'm going to start with um, a quotation, which probably is familiar to quite a few of you, but um, bear with me. There are professions more harmful than industrial design but only a very few of them. Today, industrial design has put murder on a mass production basis by creating whole new species of permanent garbage to clutter up the landscape and by choosing materials and processes that pollute the air we breathe, we breathe designers have become a dangerous breed. These lines from the opening of Victor Popanek's book, Design for the Real World, are as provocative today as they were when the book first appeared in 1971. Therefore, they also serve as a reminder that the history of sustainable design remains to be written. The provocative power of Popanek's audacious assertions can be attributed to how they run counter to the common conception of the designer as a problem solver, as a humanist engineer improving bottom lines and user experiences alike. But from a sustainability perspective, this do-good image is turned upside down. One of the key and celebrated mantras of design practice is that it is a problem-solving activity, whereas in so many ways the designed has become problem creating. And because design history largely has adopted design's self-fashioning as an intrinsically benevolent force, uh, this diametrically uh, different perspective has radical implications for approaches, ideologies, and politics of design history as well. Histories of sustainable design, therefore, should be quite different from traditional histories of design. Papanek, which you see here in conversation with uh, Scandinavian design students uh, in Finland in the, uh, around 1970, and the cover of the, the original Swedish language um, uh, edition of his uh, book, which was published a year before the English one, 
um, Papanek, the uh, Austrian-American vagabond designer and theoretician, uh, worked on what would become, would eventually become Design for the Real World from 1963, and much of it took shape in Scandinavia, where he was guest lecturing at design schools in Stockholm, Helsinki, Oslo, and Copenhagen. Papanek's persistent and public call for a radical change in design culture made him a key figure as uh, visions of sustainability gradually arose to the fore of an ideology, uh, ideologically and morally charged design discourse. Over the course of the 1960s, the more or less blind faith in progress and prosperity served up by seemingly endless innovation in science and technology, which had fueled modern design since the Industrial Revolution, took some serious blows. In design culture, uh, what started as a form of consumer activism soon evolved into environmentalism. And this transitional phase could serve as a good starting point uh, from which to explore how visions of sustainability have been formed and mediated in the history of design. Today, sustainability is an essential parameter in all design practice, education, and research and mediation. However, this green revolution, as it's sometimes called, is a glaringly white spot on the design historical map, still awaiting its scholarly historicization. Tony Fry's uh, depiction of design history's understanding of design as historically decontextualized and uh, as a particularist concern is quite exaggerated, in my opinion, and unwarranted in light of the field's development over the last decades. But he does have a point that it has hitherto not contributed much by way of connecting design's past to its role in creating sustainable futures. Design history would do well to accept his challenge, but the importance of charting the history of sustainability is not just a purview of historians of design. Firstly, it should concern historians of ideas, technology, and the environment as much as it should design historians. Researching the uh, design history of sustainability requires new interdisciplinary uh, collaborations and approaches, as well as new methods of inquiry. Secondly, in the current climate, it is hard to imagine a field of historical scholarship with greater contemporary relevance. Historical understanding of and critical reflection on um, uh, the rise of sustainability as, as the primordial trope in design discourse is essential to building a solid knowledge base and to underpin present and future decision making. Scrutinizing past ideologies and policies can provide a unique vantage point for asking tough questions of current and future ideologies and policies. As such, the history of sustainable design might also be thought of as providing a, the kind of instrumental legitimacy that some design, student, design studies scholars keep demanding of design history. But even beyond such blunt instrument, instrumentalism, this field of inquiry may improve, uh, may prove to be become what uh, that common ground, uh, the interest in our common future, uh, which will make design history more relevant to the humanities and social sciences in general. Given the immense societal significance and, uh, of sustainability and the crucial role played by design in its past, present, and future, histories of sustainable design should resound well both in contemporary discourse and cultural history broadly defined. It should be evident then that making society through science and technology sustainable or unsustainable is a matter of design. Design history has a relatively brief history as a discipline or ind independent field of inquiry. It has its roots in the radicalization of the social and human sciences in general, and particularly the renewal of art history in the 1970s. Known as new art history, this by now established tradition entailed an expansion of art history's subject matter to include also uh, expressions of visual culture, 
that were normally excluded from conventional conceptions of art. In this context, design history emerged as a field of study in its own right out of a growing dissatisfaction with the theoretical frameworks and methodological tools offered by traditional art history. Design history acknowledged the many essential differences between the mass-produced utilitarian um, objects and the unique artwork uh, which have dominated art history's subject matter. As a consequence, it has become a, fundament a fundamentally interdisciplinary field, drawing on, for instance, sociology, anthropology, social history, uh, feminist studies, cultural studies, the history of technology, and science and technology studies. The last couple of decades have been very eventful in this respect, and international design history has in part ventured quite far afield from its roots in art history. Recently, design history has toned down the conventional focus on persons, objects, styles, movements, periods, etc., and is instead becoming increasingly concerned with other aspects of an actors in design culture. There is a growing interest in the roles of mediators, critics, curators, educators, consumers, and users, as well as arenas like journalism, exhibitions, and education. A similar shift in the fo uh, in, um, a similar shift in focus has taken place in the history of technology and STS as well, and also because the demarcations between uh, so-called green technology and green design are blurred at best, there should be much to gain by joint venture in exploring uh, the history of sustainable design. And on the slide, you see an, an example of is this design or is it technology? Yes, it's both. So hence the history of design and the history of technology should uh, work together. It's a, it's a reverse vending machine, you know, one of those where you put uh, your uh, soda cans in for a refund, winning a design award. Building on these historiographical and methodological developments, such a joint venture will contribute to a design history capable of analyzing what arguably is the most important shift in design thinking since the Industrial Revolution. From a design history perspective, this topic can be examined, for instance, by asking how designers, educators, theorists, critics, promoters, consumers, and users have conceptualized visions of sustainability. However, researching the design history of sustainability requires not only an expansion of the field's subject matter into hitherto uncharted waters, it also requires a reorientation of approach from examining primarily the meanings of material culture to exceedingly exploring a far less stable, tangible, and contained domain uh, dominated by ideological discourse and moral concerns, seamlessly interwoven with, with oral, textual, and visual culture. This reorientation will also demand a new set of methodological tools, and this field of inquiry should entail such a methodological development of design history. For instance, by moving the discipline into the era of the digital humanities. As mentioned, the historical conditions for and development of sustainable design is a glaringly white spot on the design historical map. This is not for lack of interest, quite the contrary. Recent scholarship in the field has pointed out the need to pursue this topic, but has thus far made only cursory and minute attempts. Purporting to offer an overview of where design history stands today, uh, the Design History Reader, published uh, a few years back, edited by Grace Lee Smaffey and Rebecca House, includes a section on sustainable futures, 1960 to 2003. But it is indicative of the dearth of historical research on this topic, though, that five of the seven texts included in this reader are primarily sources, uh, are primary sources in the form of manifestos or social critiques such as those by Vance Packard and Victor Papanek. 
And the remaining two are excerpts from, drawn from, the larger, from larger works with a much broader scope uh, in which the issue of sustainability is but, but one of many facts. The same scarcity is evident in the recently published uh, handbook, for sustainable, uh, handbook of Design for Sustainability. This tome promisingly, promisingly opens with a substantial section on uh, historical and theoretical perspectives, motivated by the editors by the claim that, quote, the historical context leading up to our contemporary concerns about sustainability is uh, especially important to understand and absorb, end quote. However, despite this de declaration, the six chapters subsumed under this heading are primarily concerned with the present and the future. The occasional cursory glance at the past notwithstanding, these texts are not histories of sustainable design in any sense that a historian would recognize. The historical importance of the seminal figure of Victor Papanek has received some attention, but it is still only fragmentary. That, o that other major ecologically attuned renegade designer of the 20th century, Richard Buckminster Fuller, on the other hand, has been the subject of a massive surge in scholarly attention lately, and the interest in his remarkably ambitious and comprehensive design philosophy reaches far beyond the field of design history. Here you see um, he's uh, featured on uh, an American stamp, for instance, which is, I mean, probably the best evidence of his fame. Um, um, this uh, lopsidedness might perhaps be partially explained by the fact that while Papanek castigated consumer society and proposed low-tech alternatives um, to conventional industrial manufacture, Fuller, in stark contrast, advocated high-tech solutions that would elevate the standard of living for all and profiteered from the military-industrial complex. Studies of a broader scope, however, are few. Taking a history lesson from uh, how, with the exception of Papanek, Fuller, and a few other critics and visionaries, designers have not been able uh, to envision a professional practice outside of consumer culture. Victor Margolin urges designers to rethink their own profession, to earn their living in what he calls the culture of sustainability. <clears throat> Pointing at a few moments in the history of sustainable design, Martina Keitsch has provided a brief sketch of its main philosophical concepts. And similarly, Pauline Madge has outlined the reason history of ecological design broadly characterized as a conceptual move from commercially embraced uh, green design fad of the 1980s uh, via the more ideologically committed eco-design initiatives of the 1990s through to its recent incarnation as sustainable design, as social critique with real potential uh, to encourage comprehensive change in design practice. In response to Tony Fry's accusation mentioned above uh, that design history is contributing to, rather than challenging, the unsustainability of contemporary design culture, Anne Massey and Paul Micklethwaite uh, has offered examples from the history of design and the design history literature that could be said to form some, something of a proto-design history of sustainability. They suggest that the significant interests bestowed upon episodes in the history of design, such as the arts and crafts movements, attention to materials and the environment, and the uh, efforts at designing with minimal use of resources, which characterized the British wartime utility scheme, um, lends itself to a re-reading of design history in terms of sustainability. And from an educational perspective, Robert Crocker has argued that uh, the reason why design history has seemed incapable of engaging with sustainability can be traced to an outmoded conception of what design is and proposes a new direction for design history informed uh, by social and environmental history. In her introduction to a recent 
special issue of design and culture uh, called Sustainability's Prehistories. Panayota Paila notes that, uh, quote, now that sustainability has the added burden of no longer being at the margins, uh, but at the center of design concerns, the realm of design has the responsibility to vigilantly consider how this magic word of consensus came about, end quote. She goes on to argue that a history of sustainable, sustainable design uh, is needed uh, because it can introduce critical angles from which to contemplate the ambiguities, limitations, and the potentials of sustainability. Not only in a one-way direction whereby history teaches lessons for today, rather by critically interpreting earlier conceptions of nature, ecology, environment, and sustainability, history can lead to reconceptualizations of not only design tasks and pri priorities, but even the methods for history itself. And this latter, I find, is a very compelling argument and one that should be responded to. Unfortunately, though, Pilot's own special issue hardly at all discusses sustainability in the history of design, as both her and her contributing authors are concerned almost exclusively with the history of architecture. And the same can, to some extent, be said of Peter Ankel's otherwise engaging account called uh, From Bauhaus to Eco House, uh, which seeks to locate the origins of ecological design in the context of the early modernist design theory. Um, the two discourses of design and architecture certainly have commonalities and points of convergence, but they are by no means interchangeable. So this tentative treatment or circumscription of sustainability in the history of design demonstrates that the topic is seen as, an urge, as urgent in design history today. 20 years ago, Pauline Madge provided a pioneering and very valuable historiographic review that sought to link work relating to sustainability and issues, uh, sustainability issues in design activism and environmental history to design history and thereby provide a basis from which to develop a history of sustainability. And it is high time that, we, that her call is heeded. Our culture is fundamentally a culture of design. Design is the interface between us and the world, everywhere, always. But why, as Stuart Kendall asks, is this so poorly reflected in current research in the humanities when design in all of its myriad forms is manifestly both the most significant force shaping our lives today and so widely misunderstood? We might currently be ex uh, experiencing a window of opportunity for design history, however, as the so-called material turn um, is spreading across the humanities and scholars from a broad range of fields are converging on a growing cluster of ontological and epistemological theories known as new materialities. What we're witnessing is uh, an, interest in this, uh, an increasing interest in material culture among historians in general um, and it's generating a uh, research output in which design uh, history gains recognition. Not only do books stemming from sort of outside the congregation include design historians among their contributors, as well as scholars from neighboring fields writing about design, but some non-design historians even explicitly comment on the influence and significance of design history for history at large. Crucially, uh, design culture is not elite culture, but everyday culture. As Ben Heimer argues, it is the ordinary, the ubiquitous, and established, not the spectacular, rare, or new, that best illustrates the significance of design culture. In a current context, thinking of design culture as mass material culture makes it a very short step indeed to histories of sustainable design. The quest for a sustainable future is arguably the most significant aspect of recent and contemporary design culture, and one that is uh, impossible to tackle without conceiving of our material environments on a massive scale and as everyday. The implications that the material environment has had for natural 
uh, for the natural environment and vice versa uh, are best asserted when design culture is understood as mass culture, as everyday culture. But although matter has begun to matter in the humanities, the focus has chiefly been on the meanings and performances of artifacts and their interactions with people and roles of society, um, with people and roles in society. Neither the processual materialization of objects nor their ecological density seems of much interest to scholars in the humanities and the social sciences. Histories of sustainable design, however, will require a broader sense of and attention to materialities uh, below and above, as it were, these manifestations, uh, their manifestations as artifacts. A renewed and expanded notion of materiality does not, however, imply a marginalization of the role of human actors. And Anke's plea for a humanist, anthropocentric history of environmental design chimes well with recent developments in design history and design studies, as well as in the history of technology and science, and uh, at histor in the history of technology and science and technology studies, towards greater interest in the reciprocal relationships between humans and things. The primary texts uh, and that uh, the the primacy of texts and natural sciences in the hierarchy of today's environmental historiography may even explain why design has been largely ignored by historians of environmentalism and environmental historians alike. Furthermore, argues Anke, because environmental history largely has focused on issues related to the pr uh, protection of wi wilderness um, an idea that by definition stands in contrast to designed landscapes. The rich history of efforts uh, at designing ecologically sound objects, buildings, and landscapes has eluded the field. So despite this negligence uh, of the crucial role of design, the broader concept of sustainable development has long been a key topic within environmental history. In recent years, spurred by the increasing exchange between the history of technology and environmental history, issues related to sustainability and technological design have moved uh, to the forefront of many scholars' work in environmental history. Interdisciplinary research into the histories of sustainable design has the potential to contribute to the critical re-examination of sustainability within all three disciplines. Historical studies of sustainability in design discourse will also require engaging with scientific knowledge and the history of scientific knowledge. Here, too, there is much to be gained from joining forces, not only with STS, but also with environmental history. As Sarah Pritchard argues, um, that discipline has generated fresh understandings of historical phenomena and causality by incorporating knowledge from the ecological sciences. It is important to acknowledge, though, uh, that at the same time, the environment and ecology are historical categories and, object, and objects to be examined and understood. In other words, they are not simply explanas. Pritchard then prescribes a varieties of constructivist frameworks drawn from STS as an apt way of understanding the historical contingencies of environmental knowledge and systems alike. Some historians of science, though, have lamented that uh, STS recently seems to have taken a contemporary turn, leading to a segregation of historical studies from STS. Whereas historical studies were fundamental in establishing the field, much STS has become more concerned with contemporary phenomena and processes. This turn has been attributed to the strong position of a reductionist program since the 1980s, and especially actor with theory and the accompanying reliance on ethnomethodology. This does not mean, however, that STS is no longer relevant to historical studies. On the contrary, STS may indeed prove invigorating and inspire new approaches to the writing of history. Christine Ostal, for instance, argues that a new and more dynamic understanding of the interplay or the interweaving 
of text and context may be a crucial and potentially fruitful notion able to draw STS and history together. Rather than drifting apart historians to the archives and STS scholars to actions as they unfold in ongoing practice, text is an object of research to which both historians and ethnographers can meet and often must relate. And in light of the above discussion about the material turn, I would add to this that the artifacts might also hold the same promise. When the anthropologically fueled version of material culture studies emerged in the UK in the late 1980s, it became a major source of fascination and inspiration to design history, to design history that was moving away from its art historical origins. However, much like historians of science and technology have has criticized the contemporary focus of SDS, so design historians criticize the contemporary focus of material culture studies. But then the relationship between the historian and the sociologist has always been a nervous romance. Over the last decade or so, SDS has proved highly influential on design studies and design history as these fields have been exploring the socially constructed and networked nature uh, of our material surroundings. What you see here is the standard Norwegian uh, telephone booth uh, from 1937, just as an illustration of the networked nature of design. Um, Yes, uh, design, uh, and design history, um, this, these fields have been exploring the socially constructed and networked nature of our material surroundings, as well as the heterogeneous relationships between people and things. At the same time, STS is increasingly investigating design as the interface between humans and technology. As a result of this mutual reproachment, as it were, we now see, a dawn, uh, see the dawn of uh, exciting hybrid forms of scholarship that bodes well uh, for future collaborative efforts. In his keynote lecture at the 2008 Design History Society conference, tellingly named Networks of Design, Bruno Latour suggested a range of ways in which design, uh, studies of design could facilitate the drawing things together that he so uh, persistently advocates. And he says, uh, the more objects are turned into things, that is, the more matters of facts are turned into matters of concern, the more they are rendered into objects of design through and through, end quote. Studying design, he said, entails studying gatherings, entanglements, collaborative efforts, cumulative changes, practical skills, and ethical concerns, all issues of great relevance to addressing the ecological crisis. The insight gleaned from STS that the production of knowledge, as well as of doubt and ignorance, is historically contingent and uh, distinctly social is crucial to, design, to studies of sustainability in design history. The climate debate is a prominent and in our context pertinent example of such a process in which uh, at times scientific um, rules even yield to other imperatives and to the need um, to reduce complexity and to reach uh, decisions within reasonable spans of time, for instance. Studying the production of deficient knowledge, what is becoming known as agnotology, writes Frank Ukotter, may serve as a welcome reminder that knowledge is more than an issue uh, for academia. The history of how sustainable solutions have been envisioned in the design discourse provides precisely such a real life setting where design, uh, where decision making and practical application takes place with more or less uh, conscious reference to a constantly changing, complex, chaotic, and partial knowledge base. 
that there is a common ground emerging around the issues of sustainability at the, inter uh, uh, at the intersection of design history, STS, and environmental history, is convincingly illustrated also by the work of Finalne Jorgensen um, on what he calls everyday environmentalism, illustrated here by his work on, on beverage container recycling. Um, environmental historians, he writes, uh, in particular those concerned with consumer culture, are well advised to carefully consider the complex and changing relationships among designers, consumers, technologies, and commodified products on the one side, and environments, natures, and our ideas and values about nature on the other, end quote. To do so, though, environmental historians should, I propose, join forces with STS scholars and design historians in a common future um, for a common past. Uh, come to a conclusion here. Um, Perhaps it is worth returning to the problem-solving ethos of design practice, which got such bad press from Viktor Popenik. Reappraising this attitude and identity, um, I'm just showing a couple of images from a, a Norwegian project called Design Without Borders. Sort of. Uh, yeah aid program with design competence. Reappraising this attitude and identity might provide an opportunity to move beyond the so-called doom and gloom uh, which has characterized much of environmental history. Beyond the many tales of pragmatic, peaceful problem solving that design practices engaged in, design history abounds with accounts of holistic, utopian visions. Fuller, for instance, in all his uh, difference from Papenek, believed that, as he said, politics will be obsolete by the year 2000 if only designers can be in ch charge, end quote. With the crucial caveat that the um, ecological design science revolution that Fuller preached uh, implied the, under, uh, the undermining of democratic society um, Participation is an essential parameter of the sustainable of sustainable development, without which it could easily slide into what has been called eco-fascism. Uh, but Fuller's uh, remarkable effort at employing design thinking to solve complex environmental problems can serve as an example of the kind of pos positive angle which can be discerned um, when writing uh, in which can be discerned when studying visions of sustainability in the history of design. In the words of Victor Margolin, uh, designers have the ability to envision and give form to material and immaterial products that can address human problems on a broad scale and contribute to human well-being well beyond green design or eco-design, which thus far have represented designers' attempt to uh, introduce ecological principles to the market economy, end quote. So, this reappraisal of the problem-solving ethos of design practice must not, of course, entail a return to the hagiographic uh, genuflecting praise of the designer as a genius and design as a panacea for everything that is wrong with the world. A design history geared to examine issues of sustainability needs to consider design as a practice of decision-making as well as form making and of problem questioning as well as problem solving. The problem solving uh, and problem questioning ethos of design therefore warrants renewed attention if this is directed to the ways in which it has been applied to envision more sustainable futures. Exploring visions of sustainability in the history of design then could contribute to a more positive, solution-oriented outlook for our common future of the past. Thank you.